All right, we're going to do a Cascades example. And the two people I was able to coerce into this are Brett Blunden. He's currently the acting aquatics program manager, right? No, for another no? month. No, for another for month. month on the Malama National Forest, and he's counting down the minutes and the, and the hours and the seconds. And he's going to be co-presenting with Dee Dee Olson, who you saw earlier with the P&W Research Stations. And if you need a pointer, use you the sound. mouse. OK. Sounds great. Well, uh, I'm going to present the Cool Soda Project, which was an all-lands collaborative uh, restoration plan that we did on the Sweet Home Ranger District. And uh, I would just like to quickly acknowledge our partners, which were Cascade Timber Consulting, uh, the South Sanium Watershed Council, uh, our team leaders, Johan and Anita, and our core um, IDT, which was John Meyer, Tiffany Young, and Lance Gatchel. Um, so this project uh, was was a little different. We, we went through a collaborative uh, planning process where we, where we had over 50 stakeholders and uh, had six public meetings. And so probably there are quite a few of you that were part of this. And uh, we came up with a uh, restoration plan. So here's the uh, cool soda planning area. If you go directly east, you'll come to Sweet Home and you keep driving for a few more miles and you can get to the, the cool soda planning project. This is in the Soda Fork Six Field Watershed. So this is a <clears throat> map of the larger South San Yam Fifth Field Watershed. Uh, this is where Soda Fork Six Field is in relation to that. Um, I would also note that uh, the South San Yam is not a key watershed as defined by the Northwest Forest Plan, but Soda Fork Six Field is a priority watershed as defined by the Watershed Condition Framework, which was a recent uh, uh, rating metric we went through as a national uh, process to evaluate the condition of each of our six field watersheds in, in the forest. Um, also, I'd like to point out where we're looking at this map, uh, you can see that most of the area around this is, is highly dissected, but this gives a good view of this, this large flat area here, and I'll be talking about uh, that more in a few minutes. Um, so this is just a conceptual framework of kind of a way we can we can go through planning one of these uh, um, projects, and I just had a first. We we put together a first cut up here. So threatened, endangered, or sensitive species. If we had those in the the project area, those will kind of maybe be determined by other processes such as ESA regulation or survey and manage. So some of the buffers are already going to be predefined by that. Uh, but so let's say for scenario one, we, we do have listed fish habitat or a sensitive species. Uh, we look at the overall watershed context, uh, geologies, fire regime class, uh, riparian stand structure, the, the forest stand structure, and we can look at that and kind of lead us to, a, uh, to a, maybe a recommendation on what size of a riparian buffer we should have um, under that scenario. So another one might be where we are up in the headwaters, we don't have any uh, listed fish, uh, we're on stable, stable ground, uh, there's not many temperature concerns, and the stand structure is really poor. We may lead to uh, riparian buffers that are a little bit smaller. Uh, a third uh, pathway might be, uh, let's say there was a, a fish passage was blocked by a, a culvert. We may replace that culvert as part of the planning process. That may allow uh, listed fish back up into a system, and so it would be a uh, fall over here back in the larger buffer size. Uh, so here is fish distribution in Soda Fork. Uh, the lower part we have Chinook salmon, uh, uh, winter steelhead, ESA listed winter steelhead go up to a waterfall about right here. Um, Subtle Camp Creek on this side we have cutthroat and rainbows in that. We have Harder Creek over here with some cutthroat in it. And then I also did some shocking up in the upper extent of this watershed, and there's some brook trout up there. And I'm not exactly sure how, how they got there, but they shouldn't be there. <laughs> we'll see if we can fix that. Here's another, uh, another map of kind of the same thing. So this is our listed fish habitat. Uh, steelhead, of course, go all the way up to the waterfall, which this is, uh, this is marked wrong in the Federal Register. It should probably be down here. Um, uh, I would also note that down here at the mouth of, of Soda Fork and up to House Rock Falls 
is the highest density of red counts we have for Chinook salmon. So this is, this is a potential high priority spot for, for uh, Chinook salmon habitat. Um, also note on this slide that, that uh, most of the watershed is rain on snow dominated. Uh, we definitely have flashy hydrographs in here and potential for large rain on snow floods. So just kind of illustrates the importance of using, of, of large stable wood in this, in this area. Let me make sure I got everything. Okay, so uh, we calculated intrinsic potential for both winter steelhead and uh, spring Chinook. And it's kind of hard to see up there. Uh, the lower section for winter steelhead, we've just kind of got it, it's, it's about moderate. Uh, the, the upper section of Soda Fork up to the waterfall is very high. Uh, the lower section of spring, for spring Chinook is very high and it transitions over to, to low in the upper section. So there's definitely some uh, potential down lower in this system for some good spawning habitat for both species. So here's a workup of the of the geology in Soda Fork. You'll note up here uh, that there's the softer geology. This is your, your highly erosive, uh, sediment-rich uh, areas. This is where we're going to get a lot of our material for our stream beds uh, coming off of these tribs. Uh, the West Cascades durable geology, this is a little less erosive, uh, more impermeable rock. Uh, we're, we're still going to get a lot of sediment there, and I'd like to note that Right about here, there's a drainage that comes down that has, is providing a huge amount of sediment, but it's currently blocked by a culvert. So it's, it's blocking a lot of that sediment. So that's something, those are the kind of things we looked at with this restoration plan. And then, of course, there's this big flat spot we talked about earlier. Uh, this is a um, kind of a high cascades feature. It's a newer lava flow. Uh, so we're suspecting that we've got some uh, um, infiltration of water into that, which is providing a cold water inputs into Soda Fork uh, along the west side of that. Um, this is a picture of the fire regime in Soda Fork. You'll notice the kind of the reddish orange areas. These are all high fire severity uh, with a fire return interval of over 200 years. And then the most of the watershed is dominated by this mixed severity fire uh, regime, which from that we should be what you'd expect to see out on the landscape is kind of a mosaic of, of these places that were, you know, uh, intensely burned and places that weren't burnt at all. So uh, this will become important in a minute when I show you the stand structure of this watershed. Here are some management allocations on this. And I'm sorry, I've been accidentally included part of Sheep Creek in there for some reason. So uh, the watershed boundary is actually right here. Uh, the purple color is our matrix land. Um, the light blue is the Menagerie Wilderness Area, and this kind of uh, darker blue color, that's uh, some LSR in the lower, lower section. So also note that the, one of the reasons I picked this, this uh, watershed to present was, was all of the private land that we have in here. Uh, we worked with CTC, you know, how could we work across boundaries and, and manage some of this stuff. But 60% of the watershed is actually owned by... Cascade Timber Consulting, uh, private industrial forest. Here is a map of our um, of our units, past units by year of origin. So the blue ones are from the 50s, purple 60s, pink from the 70s, and so on upwards. Um, you can note that most of most of our management activities have occurred up here in the upper watershed. Um, there's a lot of, of places down here that are in Forest Service ownership that really haven't had any previous uh, uh, timber management. They're, they've been uh, fire regenerated from fire a couple hundred years ago, but uh, no harvest. Same thing along the road uh, uh, between the menagerie and, and the Soda Fork itself. There has not been uh, harvested. So this is out of the uh, watershed analysis. Um, you can see this is Soda Fork. Uh, your, your bottom two bars here are your stand initiation phase and your stem exclusion uh, phase. And you can see that they account for about 70% of the entire watershed. Um, just the, the top 30% is in this understory reinitiation and late successional old growth. So, so we really are not 
representing this older age class well in this watershed. And you can see across the rest of the fifth field where, where, a lot of these, um, uh, where a lot of these are. And here's like the menagerie, which is bordering our watershed and, and mostly you know, these older mature forests. So this is something we need to keep in mind and something we, we have to think about with the private land um, in this block is that 60% of it is going to be in private land and is going to be managed for, um, you know, rotations, timber rotations. So uh, just making it that much more important that, that uh, these late successional features are something that we take into account. So what do these stands look like now? Here's a couple photos. Um, uh, this is from this upper photo here. Um, there's a subnoble fir stand right here uh, that we're in. So let's talk about uh, wood in Soda Fork. In this year, uh, myself and, and a couple um, interns went out with a tape measure and walked the whole stream and, and took some uh, wood estimates. We, we looked for all of the stable wood in the stream. We didn't just look for um, wood that met the region's uh, criteria. So uh, anything, uh, anything that appeared to be stable that would withstand a bankful event or was pinned in, we, we counted that um, uh, as stable wood. There is not much in there, but the pieces that are in there are making a big difference for gravel retention. So uh, you can see this whole lower section uh, from the, the highway down here all the way up to Harder Creek Bridge is is pretty much devoid of wood. There were two pieces in the entire thing that were of any any size. Um, it isn't until you get way up here in the system along this section that has not been uh, managed before that you start seeing some major wood accumulations. And uh, what what you get are is kind of this variable um, distribution of wood down uh, the upper section of this stream, and and that's about what we'd expect with you know, transition and depositional zones uh, through the stream. But some of those kind of carry down onto the private land. Most of this is alder throughout here. And um, you get down, get down to this section again, the whole riparian stand is naturally regenerated. They're, they're fairly old and pretty big sized trees. Just waiting for a tipping. <laughs> Let's see. Here's some pictures. So here's the upper uh, stuff from the upper level. Um, uh, here's just a picture of, of kind of this bouldery field. And I have some more pictures from below that are coming up soon. So just an idea of what you're looking at. Not much wood, big piles of wood. So I also looked at uh, substrate estimates throughout the whole lower section here. Um, pretty much from the highway up to that bridge again, we've got mostly bedrock. The, the picture on the bottom right is what it looks like. Um, it's not until you get back up into that reference reach again that you really start getting big deposits of gravel and cobbles. Um, most, of, most of this is pretty limited on, on substrate. So that being said, this, this section through here is pretty uh, bouldery and pretty, uh, it's a little bit higher gradient and so maybe it's not the place we would expect to find a lot of uh, gravel. But the lower section certainly is. Uh, temperature trends in Soda Fork. So we also went up and just did a thermal profile and looked for cold water inputs and kind of what generally the stream was doing compared to, you know, a few measurements downstream and a few measurements upstream. Uh, we tried to get it, uh, we did do it all in one day uh, to try to not get too much variability in there and just see what it looked like. So what it basically says is this lower section down here, it's not really getting warmer or colder necessarily. It's just kind of staying the same. But then you've got this section up here, which is mainly alder dominated. It seems to be warming up from uh, kind of this, this section up here. Uh, so you've got a warm water trib kind of coming in from this West Cascades geology. That's about what we'd expect. But what's interesting is all these little tribs that come off the side of, um, of this big uh, high Cascades flat, are, they're all several degrees cooler than the, the main stem. Uh, of soda fork. So that's kind of interesting. We have these nice cold water inputs coming in. And I'd also mention that um, uh, that right here at the upstream of soda fork, the average seven day maximum temperature was somewhere in the, let's see, 63 degree range. And soda fork uh, itself averaged a seven, average seven day maximum temperature was about 60 degrees. So we're several degrees cooler 
than the salsanium proper. So it's definitely an important source of cool water for this uh, fifth field. Here's just a picture of that, uh, that cold water input. It's interesting, you can see the moss on these rocks. It looks very much like a spring-dominated system you'd find in the McKinsey or somewhere like that. So we're talking about stream temperature. We went ahead and ran some net map simulations. I think somebody asked earlier about areas of sensitivity. Um, so this is a, a run of the bare earth. Uh, this would be just for topographic shading, stream position, et cetera, et cetera. This is for vegetated conditions. And when you look at the difference of the two, uh, these, these red and yellow ones that stand out, these might be areas where they're a little bit more sensitive to thermal loading and that we should probably take a, a little bit harder look at um, uh, determine uh, what, what kind of buffer we might put on there. So there's some of that context that goes, goes into it. So at the end of the, end of the process, we've, we've come up with a preliminary plan of what we would propose to do. Uh, the, yellow, uh, the yellow sections up here are riparian reserves that we would like to uh, thin for stand structure. They're densely stocked, uh, not functioning properly. Uh, then we get down here in the lower section uh, that we've identified about 40 trees, large trees, that we'd like to tip over into the lower section of, of Soda Fork. And that would capture gravel, uh, provide spawning habitat, lower the stream temperature by influencing hyperreic flow. Um, many benefits. We have some culverts that we'd like to replace to start allowing that uh, sediment to come back into the stream to fill in. And um, a few other road treatments. Uh, oh, and then this... Uh, I would like to eradicate the brook trout uh, aggressively, aggressive control. So we'll see if that happens. So I think that's all for my part. OK, so I think what Brett's done is um, sort of take us through a scenario of, a, of how you might think of a decision tree. Um, based on fish and then looking at other uh, GIS layers with geology and thermal loading and, and wood and how you might make decisions from a 30-foot buffer down to a two-tree height buffer. Um, so that's all well and good and I agree with everything that he said. But now I enter the process and I have a different hat on. What else can I add to the situation? So. The first thing I did was get into net map and looked at stream order to see where the small streams are. And that's what we're looking at here. Um, and so you can see the small streams. Um, stream order one is this, I don't know if that's a red color, purple. So there are the first order streams. <clears throat> and when I look at those, I'm thinking of a different assemblage of organisms that live there. So I'm not thinking of the fish anymore. I'm thinking of other aquatic, aquatic riparian dependent species. And I go back to that decision tree to think of are there any threatened, endangered, or sensitive species that might occur in this area. And vertebrates are popping in my brain because um, we have a special emphasis on maintaining the persistence of vertebrates on the landscape. Um, and so salamanders are coming into my mind. And the Cascade Torrent Salamander is somewhat restricted to small streams. Um, it occurs in the foothills of the Cascade Range in this area um, from mid-Oregon all the way up into Washington. And so I'm looking at likely habitats for Cascade Torrent Salamanders. This is a sensitive species. Um, and one more thing to be considering. And so I'm thinking of those red uh, headwater streams as potential habitat for something like Cascade Torrent. And that's maybe an indicator for an assemblage of species. It's not the only species that might be there. The second thing I'm thinking when I look at a map like this is that being an amphibian, there's habitat where they breed, but then they're amphibious. They disperse across landscapes. And so I'm also looking um, at how this watershed, we might think about it in terms of um, connectivity of this organism over ridge lines. And priority considerations, you might think of how to connect this watershed to neighboring sixth field watersheds uh, to provide that connectivity, that linkage of this organism to another 
watershed where the only way they're going to get over there is go over that headwater ridge line. <clears throat> so here's an example of my thinking. Um, so here's that sixth field watershed, um, the cool soda area, and the arrows are showing one potential linkage to every neighborhood, every neighboring sixth field. So one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six neighboring sixth fields. And if you were to provide one link to each neighboring sixth field, you could choose a variety of those headwaters to link to a neighboring headwater. But there's more prioritization in my brain. If you were to look at my brain, a lot of things are going on. Um, some of those might be higher priority than others. So let's zoom out and look at how we might think about linking across uh, broader landscapes. So here, this is sixth field watersheds. The next slide, we're going to zoom out and look at fourth field watersheds. And that yellow in the middle, that's the cool soda area. And we've got some fourth field watersheds there. Now knowing that the Cascade Torrent Salamander occurs in the foothills of the Cascade, so it's not occurring at low elevations, and it's not occurring at high elevations. So I had the handy dandy net map tool map out mid elevations for me. Um, and so the blue is, are areas that run between 2,500 feet and 3,500 feet mid elevations. In a sense, you might think those are kind of like the little corridors where torrent salamanders could potentially be roaming up and down the foothills of the Cascades. So if you think of habitat in that context, those headwater streams in that mid-elevation band may be the priority ones to be connecting. So you would think of a north-south connecting route, not necessarily an east-west connecting route. So thinking back on that slide I just had, um, maybe the east-west connections are less important than the north-south connections. So you can prioritize where you are on your landscape. And looking at the slides that Brett showed just a few minutes ago, I would also be thinking of where federal lands are um, and maybe geology and other things. Mm -hmm. So you could prioritize where you might put over ridge connections for <laughs> terrestrial connectivity that might benefit more than Cascade Torrent Salamanders. It could benefit many of those 130 species that Mari Raphael talked about a few minutes ago. So the other thing that comes to my brain when I look at these mid-elevation blue lines is that there are climate change projections coming out now that there's going to be change at mid-elevations. Um, change in uh, snow falling as rain um, and also the timing of when that occurs, maybe earlier in the season. And that is a mid-elevation um, projection for the Cascades. And so these are areas that we may see some change um, in microclimate or macroclimate over time. And that would be another thing to think about here in terms of uh, maintaining thermal regimes on the landscape. That might affect your thinning decisions, for example, to maintain microclimates at the ground level in uh, adaptation management context for climate change. Here's a zoom in on that watershed with the mid elevations. And so you can see where they are and how you might use this knowledge of um, both habitat and climate change projections to add in one more element to your planning um, context. So you can see the blue uh, does sort of circle around this um, watershed and you might put that into your hopper for where you might have weighted thinning or larger uh, riparian areas, weighted thinning in your riparian areas to buffer potential future climate change. Interestingly, um, I've been working with a postdoc of my Nobi Suzuki to do another type of climate change model for the Cascade Range, and this one's based on um, several metrics, including um, snow tail data, snow water equivalent data, as well as temperature. And so the, the blue and yellow on this map is from Nobi Suzuki's model and my model of 
potential water availability in the Cascade Range where blue is um, a low risk of change in water availability and yellow is high risk of change or areas where we think water is not available. And it, it makes sense, as you go south, water is less available. But it also matches up uh, with some of these climate change predictions. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the details of this model, except the next slide I'm going to show um, where Soda Fork is relative to our model. And right away, um, there's our model, and here's the mid elevations of um, just putting mid elevations out there with NetMap. And the yellow of our model seems to match up pretty well with these mid elevations being somewhat vulnerable to risk of low water availability into the future. So my mind leads to some thoughts about that. Um, if I were to develop buffers for things like cascade torrent salamanders in an area where there is a risk of low water availability, I would start thinking about those buffers lower down in the system not just the first order streams, but get down to those second order streams where you maybe have more continuous flow now, which may be discontinuous flow into the future. So thinking of these potential futures gives you maybe a different perspective on buffering now. So I'm out of time, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. You're asking if uh, after we tip trees into the stream, if we replant. Um, no, not necessarily. Uh, generally, these are coming from well-stocked um, riparian areas, and they definitely have a second understory coming up. But uh, there are areas that I would like to plant outside of those to provide for future sources of wood. So there's definitely areas that, that need planting in addition to the tree tipping. 